Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Robert Burke, uh, and I'm here to tell you how to write a distributed ray tracer using a patching, Apache Beam. It's comma abridged because they only gave me a 20-minute time slot. Um, so let's just get going. Uh, first, who knows what a ray tracer is? OK, that's pretty good, about half. And who knows what Apache Beam is? It's been all over the conference. OK, I can skip those slides. Good. And who here knows how to write Go? OK, my apologies to everyone else. Um, I work at Google on, well, they pay me to write or work on the Apache Beam Go SDK, which is in an experimental state. And as such, all the little code samples are in Go. But fortunately for you, Go is very readable. So what I hope you get out of this talk is a little bit more, for those of you who don't know what a ray tracer is, to be able to say what a ray tracer is. If you don't know what Beam is, which was nobody, so you all know that. And basically, how you'd want to com why you'd want to be able to combine or write a ray tracer in Beam. Not necessarily with Go, but mostly in Beam. <laughs> so what is a ray tracer? Uh, it is basically the way of simulating light in order to create high quality, physically accurate images. If you've, you've, uh, if you've ever seen anything that uh, Pixar has ever done, you've seen the results of a ray tracer. They've been doing this since the 80s or so, and it generates very high quality images. And part of it just comes down to it has one simple trick. It simulates light. And by simulating light in an accurate fashion, you can get all these cool subtle effects, like caustics, which is those, oh, skipped two slides there. Uh, caustics, which is those little highlights on from uh, when light goes through any kind of refractive material, like beer, wine, glass. Reflections, whenever it comes across the, um, well, mirror surfaces any kind of specular surface. Soft shadows for the little tiny extra darkened areas called umbras and the broader extent penumbras. And of course, global illumination, which is largely just all the indirect effects from the light bouncing everywhere. Um, so there's a bajillion ways of writing ray tracers. But uh, the important thing is that they um, and you can write them in any particular fashion. But like you can, uh, one technique that they use to be able to scale all this out, because simulating where all the light goes in a room can be very expensive, is to do two main tricks. One, use randomness. And two, trace the light backwards from the eye back to the lights. Uh, the randomness component makes this kind of an application of something called Monte Carlo integration, which I'm largely bringing up because uh, last week I was in Monte Carlo, and instead of going broke, I did it entirely wrong. Um, my laptop broke instead. So instead of having a cool demo where I'm running the pipeline for you on Flink and Dataflow, uh, that's all gone. <laughs> As you can see, I'm on a loner laptop right now. So I'm afraid you'll just get the slide treatment. But this image is actually something I generated from the ray tracer before it uh, went kaput. So my apologies if you came to see the Flink, port the, the Flink data flow portability demo. Um, so let's move on. Um, so the way a ray tracer works is the camera. you set up the camera and a view frame, you cast rays from the camera through each pixel in the view frame into the image. You intersect all the objects of the image and then see, and see which one is closest. The first one that gets cut, covered uh, then reflects all the beams off to all the light sources in the scene to see if it actually provided a contribution to that pixel. Um, anything that does not have a direct contribution ends up with shadows so on and so forth. But that only covers all the direct contributions. What really happens then is we actually send out multiple arrays over and over again uh, along some probability based on the material. And this ends up recursing again and again and again and so forth, constantly just using this one trick of casting rays and intersecting them into the scene. Um, but this ends up having a very important property. Nothing, and 
this is basically the algorithm I just went through. Um, this has a very important property in that none of the rays that you're casting, aside from getting that initial position, depend on anything else within its same bounds. So that means it has a very important property for distributed computation. It's embarrassingly parallel. Come on, there we go. Which is basically how we do all these fun scaling things that have been talked about here at this conference. Um, and this is where we tie things into Apache Beam. Uh, it is basically a model for handling these kinds of computations. So I'm going to go through things rather quickly here because you all know what Beam is already. <laughs> Um, especially if you just went to uh, Ishmael's and Max's talk just prior to this. Um, but the advantages Beam provides is that, so writing a, just writing a ray tracer in a single CPU is relatively simple. I showed you the algorithm. It's basically the same loop. You recurse, done. Um, but what Beam kind of brings to the picture is those little bits of distribution that I don't want to spend time writing. People have done that far better than me, far, can do that far better than me. So I might as well leverage their expertise. And these things are like being able to like distribute it and split up the work, send it off to all the wor different workers, and get them to actually all started, and then bring everything together. So by writing our ray tracer in Beam, we can take advantage of those features. And specifically because, you know, Google's paying me to work on the Go Beam SDK. This is why I'm talking about Beam rather than direct applications with Flink or Spark or any other framework. Um, right. Um, so this here is what a very simple pipeline looks like in the Apache Beam Go SDK. And you can see how I broke it down into a pipeline, just like any other Beam SDK language. It has a pipe concept of a pipeline. And then we connect together trans P transforms to get P collections and eventually write your pipeline out. Um, we have the various implementations of the model, Pardus, co-group by keys combines. Um, since I'm going to be using these little bits of to demonstrate the diagrams later, uh, we have boxes for parties, diamonds for co-group by keys, a half box, half diamond for combines, and a triangle for flattens. And they kind of all have specific ways of transforming their keys. Like a co-group by key takes a bunch of collections with uh, the same key space and produces a output that you can iterate over everything that has the same key from all the different uh, initial inputs, so on and so forth. Um, so in uh, the Go SDK, elements can be of any particular Go type. They can be any, any retyped primitives, the, uh, any kind of complicated structs, even arbitrarily complicated structs that nest down. Um, by default, the Go SDK just encodes everything using JSON, but we also have the facility to register your own coders because while JSON is convenient for debugging purposes, we could probably do a little bit better. Um, Pardu, um, in the Go SDK, Pardu's take in uh, user do funds, which can be either um, plain Java or plain Go functions or what we call structural do funds, where we have magic methods that can uh, that uh, key into the different parts of the SDK or the bundle lifecycle. Um, the other thing to note is that it all uses real Go types. You can either return things just straight up from the result of your from the result of your uh, P, or P transform as uh, just a do, uh, as just part of your return syntax, or you can use an emitter, which is also properly typed. And those functions are provided by the system itself. Um, one thing I like about the ray tracer over than the standard word count is that I get to talk about side inputs. Side inputs are really cool. They allow you to block processing until some certain bit of the data is ready. This is essentially how they work in the SDK, starting from the bottom, unfortunately, you can specify which P collection you have uh, you're using as a side input when you're creating your Pardu. Then you can either receive it as just a strict iterator, which takes in 
pointers of the value that you're wanting to, the type of the value that you're extracting, and iterate over them. Or you can even just get a slice out, which is a Go uh, type of a variable length array, effectively. Um, co group by keys. There's the iterator concept again. Sim same kind of thing we mentioned before. Uh, combines. Combines are just a bit of extra sugar on top of a co-group by key in that they let you do some mapper side combines before you have the mixing shuffle phase, which uh, can improve efficiency significantly by uh, avoiding sending things over the machine and sending less data to the mixer. Um, so let's get over to the ray tracing algorithm. Here's, here it is again, in case you forgot. Um, we read the scenes, we set up the camera, and then for every pixel, we cast rays over and over again. Let's start with the simple bit, uh, to fin uh, which is the, the end of the pipeline. At the end of the pipeline, we want to be able to combine all the pixels together. So we end up giving it a fixed key, passing all the pixels together, and then saving the image just as you ordinarily would. We have all the pixels as uh, part of a tuple there, pixel color. So we just pass things through. Then we have uh, the generating rays phase, uh, where right now it's set up as we generate all the pixels in the scene, we send it off to the reshard, or to, to, to a group by key of some kind to reshard it, and then we generate all the samples and we reshard again. I'll get into why we do these reshards in a minute. Um, following along, uh, to read the scene, we uh, leverage side inputs. We can then read each of the objects in a scene graph separately, if we so choose, flatten those, pass that as a side input into our scene creation function along with all the lights in the image, and then produce an actual scene object, which we can then iterate, uh, which we can then um, intersect with. Uh, moving along, the actual trace takes in those initial rays, and, and the scene is a side input. And then later on, we combine, use a combine to aggregate all the samples for a given pixel together. Um, but that doesn't really explain um, it, how we do that recursion bit. One thing that one of the beam's limitations is that it doesn't have a loop construct, so there's no natural way of just in doing this kind of recursive thing. But the thing is, the moment the the, the, the more bounces you go through an image when you're ray tracing, the contributions become very small. So really, we can set it to something like three or four bounces and unroll the loop effectively to uh, get that same effect. So here we have the trace fung, followed by reshards, followed by this first prime of the trace function, so on and so forth. And then we aggregate things all the way back down. Uh, overall, the entire pipeline kind of looks like this. Uh, we've got the different components there. Um, however, there's, you might have noticed with all these reshards, there's kind of a problem with this kind of approach. Um, so say our full ray structure kind of looks like this. It's a fair number of bytes. They add up, especially because we keep needing to pass the position around, even though that's going to be mostly the same. We need to pass the pixel around a lot. So in order to just be able to propagate the information around. Um, and when we're doing things with various samples and we, and we cast additional bounces out, we're doing additional samples each time in an exponential fashion. So one ray becomes 16, becomes 256, becomes 496. It gets to be a lot. Um, how much? If we're rendering a 4K image, which has around 8 million pixels or so, it ends up with around 3 terabytes of data in that highest band of a thing. So this is probably not the right approach to write a ray tracer. Um, so this is fine. It's OK. Everything will be fine. Um, the, this is actually a current limitation with the Go SDK. Um, while it works reasonably well for batch scenarios, without something called splittable do funds, which is an 
upcoming feature in Beam, there's no way to get it to scale without those reshards. Or sharding uh, things like I did for the scene, reading the scene graph, where we read each object separately. Um, so instead, if we had, uh, so instead, the real expensive reshards are the ones that come out of the trace function. And the, what we can do instead for that, uh, to, to, to resolve that is, instead of sharding it out, we calculate all the rays ahead of time, getting the very simple thing from the spot, spot that we know from the beginning, um, and then actually maintain that same recursive loop as a single pardu, as opposed to spreading it out. Um, this has the advantage of it keeps all the pixels all the rays generated from a given pixel all together, which means we can take advantage of that very strongly in the combine function, saving us from writing out three terabytes of data. Um, future work coming up on the SDK is, like I said, splittable do funds. Um, if that happened, we could scale more easily um, and have a much easier time of writing an efficient ray tracer. Um, custom window functions would allow uh, yeah, allow users to um, write things more with the more screen space locality. Because custom window functions don't necessarily need to map to time. They can actually map to any part of your data element. So for example, we could write our windows so that they're capturing pixel locality instead for more screen space methods. And if we didn't end up with the splittable do funds, there's of course cross-language transforms where we could take advantage of existing facilities in Java and Python in order to get the scaling benefits that the Go SDK doesn't currently provide naturally. Um, so if we did have these pipe, if we did have splittable do fund, for example, we could then instead change our read objects function from reading everything in its separate transforms to a splittable version where it can shard itself out. And the same thing for the trace function where it can trace uh, shard things out afterwards. Um, I think that's all I've got. So thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> <laughs>